Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. It has been one week since 53 migrants died on the city's southwest side after being discovered in an abandoned semi-trailer. Back at the scene of the crime, a growing memorial honoring their lives with names of victims added to the display. One woman tells tonight team's Lee Waldman it's her mission to make sure each of their stories is told. Aguas frias, gratis, free water. These are our people, our community. My parents are immigrants, I'm first generation American. And so this is the best I can do. She calls it Ground Zero, the spot along Quintana Road looking starkly different than it did just one week ago. So while others are putting walls up between two nations, I'm putting a wall up of crucifixes for the people that come here and sacrifice to have a better life. Sandra Grace Martinez and other volunteers came here on their own making it their mission to honor the lives of the people who died in the back of an 18-wheeler. These have been confirmed that they have passed their cousins from Guatemala. This is a matrimony uh, and their brother. They've been confirmed as well from Guatemala. These two are friends. 19 victims have been conclusively identified, according to Bear County officials. 30 others have been potentially identified. Four victims are unidentified. Martinez has had the opportunity to learn their stories through their families who come here to grieve. This site seen as their final resting place. So Adela is over there. She's 29. I met her mother, Gloria, and Gloria came from Los Angeles, Los Angeles. So I know these people's stories. They're deep. A Guatemalan passport was found on the road. Victor Martin Ramirez Orozco, Guatemala. She won't let him or any of the other names painted on these crosses. Fidel Lucio Ramirez. Be forgotten. <laughs> Martinez tells me she's working on a memorial book for the victims that she can share with their families. Now, tomorrow, we're expecting an update on the identified victims to come from the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. We're not sure exactly when that will be happening, but they did share. They'll have an update for us tomorrow. Live on Quintana Road, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. Over the last few days, custodial death reports have been publicly published in the case of the Uvalde school massacre shooter. The reports were uploaded to the Texas Attorney General website in a record section. The reports are from the Uvalde Police Department, Uvalde County Sheriff's Office, and Zavala County Sheriff's Office, whom were called to assist with that mass shooting. The reports all have similar information except for the summary sections. Uvalde County summary states multiple agencies were involved and are waiting for more information from the pending investigation. Zavala County summary states a Zavala County off-duty deputy assisted with killing the shooter inside Robb Elementary. And a Uvalde, oh, sorry, go ahead. Tim. Meanwhile, a Uvalde <laughs> police summary states none of their officers were part of the fatal shots fired at the uh, shooter causing his death. Just a reminder of the shooting of the, ti the timeline for that shooting. The shooter made it inside the school by 1133 a.m. and three Uvalde police officers entered the school just two minutes later. The report also says the director of the Uvalde Police Department has made, quote, a good faith effort to obtain all the facts relevant to the death, end quote. But the report goes on to say their department has faced issues trying to get all of the facts. To read more on that report summary, just head over to KSAT.com. State Senator Roland Gutierrez is suing the Department of Public Safety. He believes Pete Arredondo, the Uvalde CISD police chief, is being used as a scapegoat for the Uvalde school massacre. Those statements were made during an interview with CNN. The state senator says he is suing to get access to DPS records. He goes on to say the DPS director, Steve McCraw, was quick to point the finger at Arredondo, especially since 12 DPS troopers were in that hallway when the shooter was killing the 19 students and two teachers at Robb Elementary. 91 troopers that are on scene and the eight other agencies that were in that hallway. We need to know what kind of systemic failure happened here. The state senator is speaking out just two days after Pete Arredondo sent a letter to the Uvalde mayor announcing his resignation as Uvalde District 3 councilman. Right now, Arredondo is on administrative leave as the Uvalde CISD police chief. Now to the latest, latest tragedy involving gun violence. A man opening fire from a rooftop during a 4th of July parade has left six people dead and 30 more hurt. We've been following this breaking news story from the Chicago area all day. 
The night team's Nick Monticello spoke with people in the area who say they're just tired and want things like this to end. Good evening. I, I can tell you the feeling here in Highland Park is kind of twofold. Number one, of course, they are devastated by the shooting, 24 injured, six dead, but also because they're recognizing that their Independence Day, the 4th of July, is going to be different from here on out. Now, take a look behind me here. You can see strollers and bicycles and chairs all strewn about, left behind, because these folks literally went running for their lives. An Independence Day scarred forever in this northern Chicago Main Street kind of town. A shooter perched on top of a roof, killing six and wounding 24 others. All the victims are between 8 and 85 years old. It's horrific to always see it somewhere else, but to experience it where I live is, is honestly unimaginable. Tonight, Central Avenue in Highland Park is much quieter than it should be. It's a hard day, you know, because this is my community. This is my, I've lived here for 57 years on the North Shore, and so it's personal. The suspected gunman ran after the shots. Investigators believe he blended in with the crowds before vanishing for most of the day. Then around 6 p.m. Central Time, an officer spotted him on a local freeway. There was a short chase, and eventually the suspect gave up and was taken into custody without incident. That's the end of a horrifying day. But reality is just setting in. Alicia De La Cruz lost close friends in the shooting. Broke my heart, to be honest with you. Because we know, that's people that we know. Um, we know a few of them. And this is not fair. Because they work with people. The locals here, they're starting to talk about what to do next. Memorials, candlelight vigils, things that unfortunately we are used to seeing here in the U.S. In Highland Park, Illinois, I'm Nick Monticelli, KSAT 12 News. Our latest KSAT Explains episode focuses on guns in America. The team speaks with people right here in San Antonio who know all the issues well. Guns, mental health, public health. And of course, the U.S. Constitution, all areas often scrutinized for solutions following mass shootings. You can hear their perspectives right now. Just head over to ksat.com slash explains. New tonight, San Antonio police need your help looking for this man, 75 year old Agapito Barrera. He was last seen in the 2000 block of Fishing Trail near South Zarzamora Street and Loop 410. Police say he's diagnosed with a medical condition. He was last seen wearing blue scrub pants, a Spurs t-shirt, and a silver cross necklace. Anyone with information is asked to call the SAPD Missing Persons Unit at 210-207-7660. Here at home, people are still looking for answers from a fatal shooting in a West Bear County neighborhood. Two suspects are accused of shooting and killing 65-year-old Jose Ramon. The night team's John Paul Baraja spoke with neighbors who knew Ramon and said they're stunned by what happened. I'm sorry, because yo conocí su niña. I knew his kids when they were little, they played with mine. He was a really, really good person. We don't know. We don't understand. We don't know why. For over 35 years, Maria Romero lived next to 65-year-old Jose Ramon. She remembers him as a nice person who went to church regularly and rarely left the house besides to go to work. She doesn't understand why anyone would be targeting Ramon, but it's something Sheriff Javier Salazar said was apparent back on the day of the shooting. You know, indicates they wanted him dead pretty badly and uh, the victim died there on, on scene. According to the sheriff, the suspect started shooting at Ramon's car on this street, Calle Fincias, hitting him at least once. Ramon's car then drifted off into this brush, going 100 yards deep, taking out this street sign. The suspects got out of their car and went on foot to go finish the job. A cross has now been placed here. And 15 minutes away, just across the street from several Southwest ISD schools, authorities found the suspect's vehicle abandoned here by that red and white car. Several schools were placed on secure mode and residents nearby were evacuated for safety precautions. Bear County SWAT and deputies in tactical gear combed through the area, but the two suspects managed to get away and still haven't been caught. Wednesday shooting was the second in just three days for the rural West Bear County community. Mike Marine was on the phone with his wife as shots rang out. First thing she had said is uh, she had uh, called her daughter's name. You know, hey, get down. You know, called her daughter's name, got down. And, um, you know, I was on the phone and I heard, ta, 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 ta. And, you know, especially, um, you know, something happening a couple of days prior. You just don't know what to think. And, you know, it's kind of scary for you. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. 
shifting gears a bit here right now on your screen is a live look at the 4th of July celebration wrapping up out there in Leon Valley. This over at Raymond Rimkus Park fireworks display wrapping up just a few moments ago, but don't worry. We'll have the highlights for you just a little bit later in this newscast if you can hang on. But first, let's check in with meteorologist Sarah Spivey, a hot, warm one out there. That wind not making things any easier for those using fireworks tonight. Oh my gosh, definitely no. The, the wind is, is gusting up to about 30 miles per hour right now. And as you said, Tim, it really was a hot day. Here's a look at our uh, almanac for the day. We got up to 101, our 26th 100 degree day. Elsewhere, it was 106 in Katoon, 102 in Hondo, 103 in Pleasanton and 100 in Del Rio. Coming up in the forecast, unfortunately, there's no way to say this. We're going to have an extended period of triple digit weather. And I'll be showing you those winds and a quick check of the tropics as well. Courtney. Thanks, Sarah. The annual Jubilee Return to the Shirts community will show you all of the year's 4th of July fun. And believe it or not, this man just might be the strongest man in San Antonio. That is, if he wins an upcoming competition, how the San Antonian aims to honor the city he loves so much. But first, an ongoing search at Canyon Lake for a man who disappeared in the water. Why his family is saying he should be thought of as a hero. That's next on the Night Beat. Now for a look at the headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. Tonight we are learning about a drowning investigation on the Guadalupe River. The victim is identified as 27-year-old Pablo Rodriguez from Austin. New Braunfels police and fire responded to the river along Green Road for a report of a possible drowning. When they got there, a man was being pulled from the water after going under for an unknown amount of time. He was taken to Christa Santa Rosa Hospital in New Braunfels, where he was later pronounced dead. Meanwhile, over in Canyon Lake, officials are still looking for Rob Berlingeri, who was last seen yesterday jumping into the lake to save his toddler from drowning. Berlingeri's sister told KSAT the two-year-old was hit by a wake and fell into the water. Others on the boat didn't even realize what happened, except for the toddler's mother, who also jumped in to rescue her. The toddler and mother, mother made it out safely. The family is calling Berlingeri a hero and hope the rescue crews will find him soon. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. New tonight on the Nightbeat, he calculates taxes by day and pumps iron by night. One local man is trying to crush the competition hosted by the world's strongest man. The night team's Patty Santos introduces us to the Bear County bodybuilder who is rising through the ranks. Oh, my day job, I'm a residential appraiser for the Bear County Appraisal District. 28-year-old Austin Andrade crunches numbers for the county. I value houses for taxation purposes. At clock out, he grinds metal. My second home, Heavy Metal Fitness. I'm here, I train three days a week. You know, I'm here banging weights every day. The 6'2 former college football player is seen here lifting 820 pounds and 420 pounds here in each hand. It was part of his entry audition video in the Shaw Online Classic competition hosted by the world's four times strongest man. And it worked. Attaboy. I ended up placing first in this qualifier. I scored the highest and got first out of the, pretty much the whole world. The San Antonio native is now training for the Colorado competition in August. He's one of 16 men competing. Whoever wins that gets invited to the world's strongest men competition next year. I'm always chasing numbers, like I'm trying to get better. So I hit 860 and I was 900. He and his training partner spend at least three days a week at the gym. It's where he's always felt like he belongs. Being the big kid, you know, that's the one thing I gravitated towards in high school was the weight room, and that's one place I was comfortable with. This strength is hardness through large portions of chicken, good carbs, and a lot of steak. Uh, take the average person and double it. Only four years into training and two months into pro status, he's new to the sport, but he's hooked. Weights don't discriminate. That's the biggest thing I like to say. 700 pounds doesn't matter if you're tall, short, big, small. You know, if you can lift it, you can lift it. Patty Santos, KSET, 12 News. Ooh, I want him on my side. That is a mountain of a man. <laughs>
All right. Well, here's a look at the 4th of July Jubilee in shirts today. The celebration started with a 5K and parade this morning, followed by a carnival at the Tulemeyer Park Large Field. They also had live music and fireworks display tonight. Warm one out there for the 4th of July festivals, but hey, yeah, we're used to it here. and We've been working on it since May. You we can are. see some fireworks there. Yeah, those are the variety, the but uh, <laughs> hopefully they're doing it as safely as possible. Yeah. yeah. It's America. Yeah. Close well, stuff up. I believe that is well within city limits there. We caught you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have some fun. <laughs> Zoom in. Zoom in. <laughs> of course, of course. You know, yeah, by this time we are well acclimated to the heat. We have had 26 100 degree days. I want to take you back in time. We'll talk about some Independence Day climatology. Let's take a look. When was the hottest 4th of July? Well, it was just back in 2009 when we got up to 103. Today, our high was 101, so we were only two degrees off of that. Our coolest high uh, temperature on Independence Day was back in 2007 when we only got up to 82 degrees. Our wettest 4th of July, almost two inches of rain back in 2003. We could really use the rain but we got nothing today. Outside right now, other than those fireworks, you can see that we're dealing with mostly clear skies, 83 degree, 88 degrees rather, and those winds are sustained at 23 miles per hour in San Antonio. It feels though like it's still in the low to mid 90s because of the high humidity. And again, those winds are what we've been concerned about with the fireworks, so if you are planning to continue to celebrate tonight. Just know that those winds are not going to let up. We're going to continue to see them gusting up to about 30 miles per hour. Please use caution tonight. Heat high is in place and this stubborn thing is just not going to go anywhere. In fact, it's going to move closer to San Antonio in the coming days. So tomorrow we'll be at 100 and then Wednesday 101 is that heat high inches closer 101 on Thursday by the weekend. We're going to be at 102, 103 degrees in San Antonio. That is uh, almost above average by 10 degrees. So yes, we're used to the heat right now, but it is hotter than usual out there, all because of that heat high. Now, oftentimes in the summer, we look to the tropics for any kind of rain. There is a hurricane out in the Pacific. It's actually category three. It's expected to be category three hurricane, Hurricane Bonnie, but really just a, a storm for the fish. It's going to be out in the uh, Pacific Ocean, and unfortunately, where we would need some development to happen in order to get a rain chance here in South Central Texas. No development is expected in the Atlantic over the next five days. Of course, hurricane season does go through the end of November, so we're going to continue to keep you updated. Early tomorrow morning, going back to work, uh, it's going to be 77 degrees in the early morning hours, mostly cloudy. Humid, 84 at 10, 90 at noon, and then in the afternoon, 100 degrees for the high temperature. Not quite as breezy tomorrow, but we will have winds from the southeast at about uh, 10 miles per hour at times. And the humidity is going to stay high, so heat index value tomorrow during the peak heat of the day, 101 to 104. Look at all those numbers there on the forecast. We've still got all of July and all of August to get through. We're likely going to come close to the top three 100 degree day years in San Antonio. Pretty brutal forecast right there. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. All right, Andrew, for those who are missing basketball, get a chance to see some of the young guns start playing in the NBA for Summer League. And obviously it's going to be very important because a lot of these young guns are going to be playing during the regular season this year, at least we think. When we come back, we'll hear from Joshua Primo, the young gun himself, 19 years old, second year guard, on his expectations for this season. Plus, Joey Chestnut does it again. Got that too next. It's experience. I think at the very least, even if things don't go well, hopefully it's something we can learn from. We talked about that even as a team in terms of just enjoying and embracing the experience. Summer League head coach Mitch Johnson knows how important these next few weeks are to the development of the young Spurs in big board sports. Our San Antonio Spurs are four days away from kicking off play in the Las Vegas Summer League, and all eyes will be on the 19-year-olds to see what they can do on the court. That includes Joshua Primo, who is entering his second season with the Spurs after an impressive rookie campaign. His stats don't look all that great at first, but he started 16 games and nearly averaged double-digit points, four rebounds, and three assists per game over the final two months of the regular season. What did he learn from that experience? I think I've learned that with each and every game, uh, it takes a certain level of focus, it takes a certain level of preparation, 
Um, and if you're not ready to come to play, then any any team on any given day can uh, give you the business. So uh, just knowing that and coming into each game with the same mindset, um, the same kind of intensity, I think that's going to help me a lot going into next year. The Spurs will open summer league play against the Cavaliers this Friday at 4 p.m. Earlier this afternoon, WNBA star Brittany Griner reached out to President Joe Biden directly through a handwritten letter asking for her and other detainees' freedom. Griner has been detained in Russia for 130 days now, awaiting trial on charges that she tried to smuggle vape cartridges with cannabis oil into the country. Here's an excerpt of what Griner wrote, quote, As I sit here in a Russian prison alone with my thoughts and without the protection of my wife, family, friends, Olympic jersey, or any accomplishments, I'm terrified I might be here forever. I believe in you. I still have so much good to do with my freedom that you can help restore. I miss my wife. I miss my family. I miss my teammates. It kills me to know they are suffering so much right now. I am grateful for whatever you can do at this moment to get me home, end quote. Here's Mercury head coach Vanessa Nygaard's reaction to the letter and why it's taking so long to get Griner home. It made me cry. You know, just hearing our words, it's a statement about the value of women. It's a statement about the value of a black person. It's a statement about the value of a gay person. Um, all of those things. And uh, we, we know it. And so that's what hurts a little more. Griner's trial will continue on Thursday. She has yet to enter a plea. Reports indicate she will likely plead guilty to placate Russian officials. Keeping it across the pond, the Wimbledon men's quarterfinal field is set. Rafael Nadal won his fourth round match today in straight sets, setting up a meeting with 11th seeded American Taylor Fritz in the next round. Nick Kyrgios also advanced today. After a heated battle with Stefano Tsitsipas on Saturday, Kyrgios edged American Brandon Nakashima in five sets to move on to the quarterfinals. Top seeded Novak Djokovic opens the next round of play tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. against Italian Yannick Sinner. The Astros have basically been untouchable over the last week with six straight wins. Today they look to make it seven in a row against the Royals and they're going to need a rally. Trailing six to three in the bottom of the eighth, Kyle Tucker comes through in the clutch with a base hit into center. Two runs score and it's a one run game. Yuli Gurriel then keeps the line moving with a bouncer that sneaks through the infield. Alex Bregman rounds third and he scores and we're all tied up at six heading into the bottom of the ninth. Game tied at six, two outs in the ninth. Jordan Alvarez up at the plate. Good night. A solo shot to right center is your game winner. Astros complete the largest rally of their season and walk it off with their seventh straight win, 7-6. to six. When we come back, Joey Chestnut does it again. He will curse and spit and sneer and shout his name at the heavens. I am the shining arc of humanity. Jordan, Brady, Gretzky, Phelps, Bolt, and Chestnut. Today at Coney Island, we were all witnesses to greatness once again as Joey Chestnut claimed his 15th career title at Nathan's Famous Hot Dog Eating Contest, and this might have been his most difficult title defense. Chestnut was wearing a surgical boot on his right leg, and he was even interrupted by a protester 17 dogs in. He wasn't phased at all, throwing the protester aside as he continued munching his way towards glory. Chestnut downed 63 hot dogs and buns. It wasn't a record, but it was more than enough to claim his seventh straight championship. It hurts, but uh, I, was, I was in the dome pretty good for a little bit, and I was ignoring it, and uh, I slowed down, but it, it, was, uh, it was a crazy contest. Uh, I'm happy I was able to, able to come through on top. And after missing last year's competition due to pregnancy, Miki Sudo returned to the women's competition and won her eighth career title by eating 40 hot dogs. So between the two of them, if they both win at 10 minutes each, that's over 100 hot dogs eaten. I don't think I've eaten 100 hot dogs within the last, I don't know, 10 years? Or ever. Yeah, that too. <laughs> cool. I can't watching those. We'll be right back. Nothing else to say. <laughs> Finally tonight, we leave you with the fireworks from Raymond Rumpicus Park in Leon Valley. Happy 4th of July. Have a great night and enjoy the show.